Greetings. In this video, my aim is to provide a slow description of query bank normalization, which was introduced in the paper Cross-Modal Retrieval with Query Bank Normalization in collaboration with Simeon Vlad Bogolin, Jana Koitoru, Hailin Jin, and Yang Lu, published at CVPR 2022. This is an outline for what we will discuss. We will start with the motivation for this work. We will then talk about related work. Next, we will describe the hubness phenomenon and offer a brief summary of how cross-modal retrieval works as additional context for the problem. We will then describe QB norm and the range of experiments used to assess whether it is effective in mitigating hubness. We will then conclude with a brief discussion of limitations and societal impact. Okay, with the plan in place, then let us leap into the motivation. Our starting point is to note that continued improvements in the price performance of hardware across sensors, storage and networking have enabled massive digital archive growth for various forms of visual and audio media. To make use of this data, we'd like to be able to search it effectively for both scientific and commercial applications. An appealing way to search is with natural language queries, in which the user describes the target of their search exactly as they would do to another human, rather than using a specialized database language like SQL. Taking steps in this direction, a significant body of research has focused on developing joint embeddings that enable very efficient search with natural language queries for content across images, audio, and video. However, a challenge that can arise when using high dimensional embeddings is the emergence of hubs. These are embedding vectors that appear among the nearest neighbor sets of disproportionately many other embedding vectors. Hubness is not a new idea, but given the recent progress in joint embeddings, it is natural to ask whether hubness affects modern joint embeddings and is therefore worthy of study. The motivation for tackling hubness to the degree that it exists is that it can harm retrieval performance and as such, a range of methods have been proposed to address it, particularly in the NLP and zero-shot learning research communities. In the context of cross-modal retrieval, the inverted softmax has been proposed as one such possible solution. However, existing approaches to tackling hubness for cross-modal retrieval often have at least one of two shortcomings. Typically, they assume concurrent access to multiple test queries, which may not always be practical when deploying a search system, and lack robustness in the sense that they can make retrieval performance worse when applied naively across unfavorable data distributions. Since these issues indicate some room for improvement, the question arises of whether we can find a more practical solution to addressing hubness. Next, we turn to related work. QB norm builds on a number of ideas in the research literature. I'll mention a few representative papers here. The first direction relates to the development of cross-modal embeddings. One influential work exploring this direction is the devise or deep visual semantic embedding model of Frome et al. This work sought to learn a non-linear cross-embedding of text and images. They began by pre-training a traditional visual model with a softmax in a fully supervised manner. In this case, the model is a convnet. Independently, they also trained a word-to-vec style skipgram language model on a text corpus. Then, the softmax layer of the visual model is discarded and a new transformation layer is added, which is trained to regress the embedding values of labels by optimizing a similarity metric between them. During inference for a new image, the visual model computes its vector representation 
which is projected via the transformation layer, and then a nearest neighbor lookup is used to retrieve the closest label. The embeddings are trained via a hinge rank loss. Devise illustrated two significant benefits over typical softmax one of n training. The first is that the model produced more semantically reasonable errors, which is to say that when considering predictions under the WordNet hierarchy, the incorrect predictions were typically closer in the hierarchical label space than those of the softmax. Secondly, and more importantly, the embedding space enables zero-shot classification, since the model can classify any concepts for which it has word embeddings. QB norm specifically targets improvements in performance for cross-modal embedding frameworks, many of which build upon the ideas introduced in Devise. The second body of work has explored various aspects of the Hubness phenomenon. The work of Radovanovic et al. studied this problem in detail, characterizing the notion of Hubness as positive skew in the distribution, here denoted NK, of the number of times a point appears in the k nearest neighbors of other points. One illustrative set of experiments in the paper consider synthetic data sampled uniformly from a unit hypercube. We plot this distribution for three-dimensional data when using Euclidean, fractional, or cosine distance functions. The x-axis denotes the number of times a point appears in the five nearest neighbors of other points, and the y-axis denotes density. We observe a typical binomial distribution. However, as the dimension is increased first to 20 and then to 100, the distribution becomes highly skewed to the right. Note that the latter plot uses log scaling on each axis. This skewness corresponds to a small number of hubs that appear very frequently as nearest neighbors. Beyond synthetic data, this paper examines hubness from both a theoretical and empirical perspective, and we will discuss it in more detail shortly to get a better handle on the hubness phenomenon. A third direction has explored techniques to mitigate hubness. An example is the work of Smith et al, which, among other contributions, introduced the inverted softmax. This work was focused on the problem of learning bilingual word vectors by first learning word vectors independently for two languages, and then learning a linear transformation to bring them into alignment. One observation made by the authors is that for such a linear transformation to be consistent, it must be orthogonal. Here, consistency refers to the fact that the mapping that transforms a given word in the source language to the target language should also be able to return it back to the original source word. They were able to obtain good alignments by enforcing orthogonality as a constraint, which can be achieved efficiently with SVD. Here are some examples of embeddings of words in English and Italian that were trained independently and then brought into alignment with just 5,000 disjoint paired examples using SVD. They look reasonable. A second contribution of this work was to propose to use an inverted softmax over similarities to mitigate hubness during the nearest neighbor search for word vectors. This works similarly to a traditional softmax except that the normalization is performed over the similarities to the source vectors rather than to the target vectors. We'll discuss this in more detail shortly. Finally, a fourth line of work has explored the application of hubness mitigation strategies to cross-modal retrieval, an example of which is the 2019 work of Liu et al, which explored techniques to mitigate hubness using multiple test queries. As part of this work, the authors first proposed the k nearest neighbors margin loss that aims to provide a more robust alternative to the widely used bidirectional max margin ranking loss with respect to label noise. In particular, instead of enforcing a margin between the positive similarity and the similarity of the hardest negative pair in the batch from each modality, 
a loss is proposed that considers negatives among the k hardest negatives from image to text descriptions and the k hardest negatives from text queries to images. This is shown to achieve good results more consistently than either the max margin ranking loss or the sum margin ranking loss. Of most relevance to QB norm, the authors also consider inference time procedures to mitigate hubness by leveraging the bipartite assumption that for most text to image retrieval benchmarks, there is a one to one correspondence between queries and images in the test set. This is done by applying hubness mitigation techniques over the test queries, such as the inverted softmax and CSLS, a method we will discuss later. They show that on benchmarks such as MS Coco 5K, that relative to a naive nearest neighbor baseline, use of inverted softmax and CSLS bring a major boost. One limitation of this work is that it requires concurrent access to the set of test queries, which may not be a practical requirement for real world retrieval systems in which users do not submit their queries at the same time or systems for which we cannot be sure that there is a one-to-one -one matching between text queries and gallery images. One contribution of the query bank normalization paper is to demonstrate that concurrent access to test queries is not required to mitigate hubness effectively. Next, we turn to the hubness phenomenon. An important piece of background context when working with high dimensional embeddings is the notorious curse of dimensionality, a term coined by Richard Bellman in 1961 in his work developing dynamic programming techniques for tackling variational problems. He observed that while dynamic programming is a powerful tool with broad applicability, it still fails in the face of many problems thanks to the fact that the volume of mathematical spaces grow very rapidly, i.e. exponentially, as their dimensionality increases. This can perhaps be most readily seen with some visual examples. Suppose we start in one dimension, and we want to sample points that fill the space in such a way that no point is more than one unit away from its nearest neighbour. Here, I've masterfully drawn four points on a line spanning three units that has this property. So we can see that to densely fill the space, four points are required in one dimension. Once we move to two dimensions, rather than four points, we now need four squared, i.e. 16 points to fill the space. For three dimensions, we require four cubed or 64 points to fill the space. Once you go above a few dimensions, the space becomes very roomy indeed, and you need a massive number of points to densely fill it. As a consequence, high dimensional data is often very sparse with respect to the space that forms its home. Broadly speaking, high dimensional spaces cause mischief in machine learning, particularly for the broad families of methods that rely on having plenty of nearby neighbors in their input space or their embedding space in order to make good decisions. Among the various properties of vectors in high dimensional spaces linked to the curse of dimensionality, one widely observed effect is known as distance concentration, which refers to the tendency of distances between all pairs of points in high dimensional data to become almost equal. This has potential consequences for methods that rely on nearest neighbors. In our friendly, familiar and intuitive low dimensional space, for any query point, it makes reasonable sense to search for its nearest neighbor under an appropriate distance metric. However, in high dimensional space, things look very different. All points appear to be scattered on the surface of a hypersphere, which we flattened here to two dimensions to build intuition. If we take a query point, such as this one, which can be thought of as lying close to the center of a circle, there is still a well-defined nearest neighbor. However, this time, the difference in distance between the query and its nearest neighbor relative to the distance between the query and any other point in the space 
is marginal. In fact, the query is approximately the same distance from every other point. What on earth is going on here? This effect has been carefully studied, starting with theoretical work examining the concentration of the Euclidean norm by De Martin in 1994, who observed that when sampling independently and identically distributed vectors from an d-dimensional unit hypercube, the expected norm of the vectors grows with the square root of the dimensionality, while the variance of the vector norms remains constant. The consequence of this is that once you reach high dimensional spaces of random vectors, everything appears to lie on the surface of a sphere. Later work has extended this result in various ways, relaxing the assumptions of the theorem and examining how distance concentration affects fractional norms, for example, but the Euclidean case is all that's needed for our intuition and discussion here. A second aspect of the curse of dimensionality relating to nearest neighbours is the Hubness phenomenon, which was investigated in great detail by Radovanovich et al, building on a link initially suggested by Berenzweig in a 2007 PhD thesis. To define Hubness, we will follow Radovanovich et al and let D denote a set of d-dimensional real points and let nk of x denote the number of k occurrences of x in D. That is to say, the number of times that x appears in the k nearest neighbours of other points in D under some appropriate distance metric. The core property of Hubness is that, under fairly widely applicable conditions, as dimensionality increases, the distribution of k occurrences skews to the right. In effect, this amounts to producing popular nearest neighbours, known as hubs, that appear in the k nearest neighbour lists of many other points. In various forms, Hubs have been observed much earlier in practical deployments of retrieval applications for domains such as speech recognition, fingerprint identification, and music retrieval. Still, the reasons for their emergence were not well understood, which raises an interesting question. What links the emergence of hubs to high-dimensional spaces? Let's look at the theory of hubs put forward by Radovanovich et al., which has two key ingredients. In high dimensional spaces, a fraction of points will remain non-trivially closer to the mean than all other points. These points become hubs. To describe the theory, we'll discuss the simplified setting in which data points follow a unimodal distribution, but the same ideas can be extended to multimodal distributions like mixture distributions. An important aspect of this theory is that points close to the mean are likely to be hubs. We'll start by building intuition for this result using empirical evidence before broaching the theory. For this purpose, the authors sample synthetic data IID from a uniform distribution. Here is a scatter plot for the case when the data points have three dimensions, showing distance from the sample mean on the x-axis, and the number of times each point appears in a five nearest neighbor list on the y-axis. No clear pattern or correlation emerges. However, when we move to 20 dimensions, we see some correlation. And by the time we move to 100 dimensions, the correlation is striking. Points closer to the mean are much more likely to appear in many five nearest neighbor lists and thus form hubs. This experiment is replicated with normally distributed data, as well as with other distributions and distance metrics that exhibit hubness. And in each case, an essentially identical effect is observed. Now that we have the intuition, let's examine the first claim, which is that in effect, a non-negligible fraction of points will remain non-trivially closer to the mean than other points. This idea is closely linked to the distance concentration phenomenon that we discussed previously. In particular, we have seen that the distribution of distances to the dataset mean has non-negligible variance for finite dimensions, even when the dimensionality is high. More specifically, 
we saw that the asymptotic behaviour of variance is independent of the dimensionality in the theory of distance concentration for Euclidean norms. As a result, the existence of a non-negligible number of points closer to the mean is expected in high dimensions. To make this a bit more concrete, we can visualise the distribution of Euclidean distances to the true data mean for IID normal data. The x-axis depicts distance from the mean of the distribution, the y-axis depicts density, and different colours indicate different dimensionalities, with increasing dimensionality curves moving from left to right. While the average distance to the mean increases with dimensionality, the variance of the distributions remains approximately constant. As a result of this variance, even as the distance concentrates, a chunk of data points will remain non-trivially closer to the mean than others. The second claim is that these points that are closer to the mean become hubs in higher dimensions. To understand the idea behind this claim, consider two points drawn from the data distribution at specific distances from the origin. In particular, we will consider point AD, which is two standard deviations closer to the origin than the mean distance to the origin, and BD, which is at the mean distance from the origin. Now let's plot the distribution of these points for different dimensionalities, each dimension depicted by a different colour, with distance from other points on the x-axis and density on the y-axis. The solid lines depict the distributions for point AD and the dashed lines are the distributions for point BD. The key observation is that as dimensionality increases, the two distributions move slightly apart. So this distance is less than this distance, which is less than this distance. Since this separation effect is subtle, it can be hard to see. So here is a plot depicting the differences as dimensionality increases with dimensionality d on the x-axis and the difference between the means on the y-axis. The further the means move apart, the more separated the distributions, and consequently, the more hub-like the points from AD become. One way to interpret this is to say that, although we know that distance concentrates with greater dimensionality, the asymptotic tendencies of distances of all points to different reference points do not necessarily occur at the same speed. So, higher dimension leads to greater separation in these sub-distributions, which in turn leads to hubs. To round out our understanding of hubness, it's also interesting to consider a competing hypothesis for the cause of hubs. For this, we will examine the elegant theory of Low et al, which takes the alternative perspective that hubness is not directly due to high dimensionality. Instead, it is a boundary effect, or more broadly, an effect of density gradient in the data. As a consequence, it is really an artefact of the data generation process rather than something intrinsic to high dimensions. The authors provide four experiments to support their theory. The first constructs data sets of 10,000 points and examines the distribution of occurrences among 10 nearest neighbour sets for various data set samplers. The x-axis depicts the number of dimensions and the y-axis depicts skewness. The first observation is that, as seen in the previous experiments of Radovanovic et al, hubness, as measured by skewness, does indeed increase with dimension when sampling either from a normal distribution, shown in red, or uniformly from a hypercube, shown in blue. An additional observation can also be made here, which is that there is considerably greater hubness from the normal distribution than there is for the hypercube data. Low et al. suggests that this provides a first hint that hubness may be tied more to density gradients than dimensionality, since the normal distribution has a density gradient everywhere, while the dataset sampled from the hypercube only has a density gradient at its hypersurfaces. In high dimensions, many data points will be close to these hypersurfaces, 
and thus will be influenced by the density gradient there, but still fewer than occur in a normal distribution. We get a further clue from the fact that far less hardness occurs when sampling uniformly from a hyperbole, shown in green, which has a radically smaller surface relative to a hypercube, and no corners where the density gradient can be particularly high. However, an even stronger argument that high dimensionality is not the sole cause of hubness comes from considering the fact that an m plus 1 dimensional hypersphere is essentially an m-dimensional, finite, boundaryless space. This is easiest to see in low dimensions, where a 2D hypersphere, which is simply a circle, can be interpreted as a wrapped around line that represents a one-dimensional, finite space without boundaries. Since a lack of boundaries limits the presence of density gradients, we observe no hubness when sampling uniformly from a hypersphere at any dimension, shown here in orange, either in skewness as depicted in the plot, or in other metrics designed to capture hubness. The next experiment shows that hubs also occur in low dimensional space, where they can be examined to understand their cause. For this, the authors sample 250 datasets of points uniformly from a square and plot the 12 largest hubs in each dataset according to their location. Here, the darkness of the hubs encodes their co-occurrences, i.e. their hub size. We see immediately that not only are there far more hubs at corners, but also that these hubs are darker, which is to say, they have higher k-occurrences. The argument for why this occurs is quite simple. The points in the very corners of the square, and to some extent also the points on the edges of the square, have fewer neighbours to choose from. Hubs then arise as points nearby these points, because they can collect them as k-nearest neighbours even when they are proportionately further away since the corner and edge points have fewer choices as to their neighbours. At the same time, hubs are sufficiently far from the surface to ensure that they still gather their full complement of neighbours from interior points. This effect is visible at the edges of the square, but most pronounced at the corners, where fully three quarters of the space is void of points. The third experiment aims to provide a more explicit link between hubs and boundaries. If the true cause of hubs is indeed density gradients at boundaries, it should be possible to create hubs in low dimensions by sampling from a space that possesses a large boundary. To explore this idea, the authors sample from a grid of non-overlapping cubes, as illustrated in two dimensions here. We can then visualise how hubness grows for five nearest neighbours in a three-dimensional space with number of cubes per dimension on the x-axis and h2, which is a metric that measures the number of hubs on the y-axis. We see first that when sampling 20,000 points, we observe the increase in hubs directly predicted by the theory as the number of cubes, and therefore points near boundaries, increases. When sampling 10,000 points, we initially see the same trend, but steeper, before a drop when we reach 10 cubes per dimension. This occurs simply because there are now so many cubes that there are no longer enough points to fill them sufficiently densely that the hubs can profit from boundary effects. Note that while it is possible, as shown here, to produce hubs in 3D, it is harder than in higher dimensions. As also noted by Radovanovic et al, hubness is closely linked to the idea of kissing number, which is the number of non-overlapping unit spheres that can touch another unit sphere. A data point cannot be the nearest neighbour of more points than the kissing number of the space it lives in. In three dimensions, the kissing number is 12, which places a hard limit on the sizes of the hubs that can occur. A final experiment 
illustrates some additional interesting behaviour. We saw in the first experiment that in high dimensions, greater hubness emerges for a hypercube than a hyperball. The idea of this experiment is to jolt the points in the corners of the hypercube so that they keep the same direction from the origin, but have their length scaled to fall within a unit hyperball. This experiment is conducted for 10 nearest neighbours on 10,000 data points, with the number of dimensions on the x-axis and skewness on the y-axis. Compared to the hypercube and hyperball seen previously, the jolted shape is somewhat surprisingly even less prone to hubs than the hyperball. Lowe et al. note that this makes complete sense within their theory. The jolted shape acts much like a hyperball, but has pushed additional points away from the surface, further reducing the boundary effects and thus reducing hubness. We turn next to cross-modal retrieval. Before introducing QB norm, we'll give a brief description of the task that we are tackling, namely cross-modal retrieval and the metrics used to assess performance. The objective of the retrieval task is to rank a gallery of samples according to how well they match a query. In cross-modal retrieval specifically, the query and the gallery samples are assumed to come from different modalities. To make this concrete, here we will focus on cross-modal retrieval in the scenario where we compare text queries against a gallery of videos, which is the subject of a number of experiments in this work. However, other modalities like audio and images can also be considered, as can the symmetric task of retrieving text descriptions with a video query. We can visualize the retrieval process by assuming we are given a query text and a gallery of videos. We pass both to a retrieval model, which then gives us a ranking over the gallery. The most widely used performance metrics for this task are recall at K, which measures the percentage of test queries where the ground truth target is ranked among the top K videos, and here higher is better, and the median rank of the ground truth target, where lower is better. QBNorm is designed for retrieval methods that use cross-modal embeddings. As in the previous slide, I'll illustrate how these work for text queries and a video gallery. The essence of this approach is an embedding architecture. It works by taking each video and mapping it through a video encoder to produce a vector in a real valued embedding space. Each text description or query is then also mapped through a text encoder into the same space. The encoders are typically instantiated as deep neural networks. The key idea is that video and text are mapped to vectors, called embeddings, such that embeddings are close if the text describes the video, and the embeddings are far apart if the text does not describe the video. To see how this works for retrieval, suppose we have three videos that we want to search with a text query. Each video is mapped into the embedding space together with the text query. In this particular example, we observe that the embedding of video 3 is the nearest neighbour of the text query. This is then returned to the user as the top-ranked search result. We will now introduce the QB norm framework. Now we've defined the task of cross-modal retrieval and we're familiar with hubness. So let's look at exactly why hubness is a problem for cross-modal retrieval. We'll consider a simplified case in which we have a gallery consisting of just two samples, G1 and G2. We'll also suppose that we have two queries, Q1 and Q2, and that Q1 is a good match for G1 and Q2 is a good match for G2. What happens if one gallery sample, in this case G2, is a hub? The problem is that G2 will then have a disproportionately high similarity to both queries, 
dominating these similarities to G1. Here, I'm using edge thickness to denote similarity strength. As a consequence, query Q2 will correctly retrieve gallery sample G2. However, query Q1 will also retrieve G2 thanks to its hardness and consequent high similarity to Q1. The goal of query bank normalization is to mitigate this effect. In addition to the gallery and queries considered previously, we will assume access to some additional set of samples that we will call a query bank. The key idea is to first use the query bank to probe which gallery samples might potentially be hubs by calculating their similarities, here referred to as QB norm similarities. Since G2 is a hub, it is likely to have high similarity with the query bank as well as with the original queries. We then perform a normalization step using the QB norm similarities, which recalibrates the original similarities in a way that accounts for the hub. As a result, query Q1 now retrieves gallery sample G1 and query Q2 retrieves gallery sample G2. Let's dig into how this works in more detail. We begin with query bank construction. Our motivation is that we'd like to probe the hubness of the collection of gallery samples so that we can compensate for it. To achieve this, we construct a disjoint query bank of n samples, b1 up to bn, which share the same modality as the query mq. Next, for each gallery sample, gj, we compute a probe vector. This probe vector is an n-dimensional vector where the ith element is defined as the similarity between the ith query bank element and the gallery sample. To make this concrete, suppose j equals 1, so we are computing the probe vector for gallery sample g1. This vector has two elements, the similarity from b1 to g1 and the similarity from b2 to g1. We repeat this process for the remaining gallery samples. So for our hub vector g2, we would also compute its similarity to b1 and b2. The resulting vectors are stacked to form a probe matrix P of size g by n, which for us is 2 by 2. The next step is to compute, for each query, the raw unnormalized similarities we would compute if we were performing standard retrieval. This corresponds to producing a vector with the same size as the gallery, where the jth element is the similarity between the query and the jth gallery sample. Taking query Q1 as an example, the unnormalized similarities are the two values representing the similarity from Q1 to G1 and from Q1 to G2. When it is needed during inference, this step would likewise be performed for Q2, though it is important to note that there is no dependency between Q1 and Q2. Here, the unnormalized similarities would be those to G1 and G2. Finally, the last step is to define a query bank normalization function, QB norm, which takes in the unnormalized similarities, shown in red, and the probe vector, shown in blue, and computes for each query a new set of normalized similarities. Thus, for Q1, we replace the unnormalized similarities with those produced by QB norm, and similarly, we perform a replacement for Q2. Various designs for the QB norm function can be considered, and we'll discuss these shortly. First, however, let's walk step by step through the algorithm for how QB norm is applied in practice. The inputs to the algorithm are a collection of queries, Q, together with a gallery to be searched, G. The first step is query bank construction, in which we select n samples from the query modality to form the query bank. The second step is similarity normalization. Here, 
for efficiency purposes, we pre-compute the query bank probe matrix. This pre-computation is important in practical deployments because it allows us to amortize the cost of computing the probe matrix across multiple queries. To this end, we loop over gallery samples in G, loop over query bank samples in B, and compute the corresponding probe matrix entries. At inference time, when we wish to perform retrieval, we loop over our queries, then loop over our gallery samples, and for each one, compute the unnormalized similarity. We then normalize these similarities with the probe matrix and perform an arg sort to return the ranked list of gallery samples to the user who submitted the query. A number of design choices can be adopted for the QB norm framework, which allows for variations on both query bank construction and similarity normalization strategy. In fact, one contribution of this work is to show that several existing approaches to hubness mitigation introduced in the zero-shot learning and NLP literatures can be interpreted within a unifying QB norm framework. The first such method is the globally corrected retrieval method of Dinu et al, who focus on the zero-shot learning problem for bilingual translation and image labeling. Two techniques are proposed to mitigate hubness. In each case, a similar idea is adopted. The hubness of the gallery samples, which are known as targets in their terminology, is estimated using test queries, which they refer to as pivots. In addition to using the test queries, they also conduct experiments that expand the pivot set to include further unlabeled examples. The first method they proposed, termed NNNRM, scales the gallery similarities with respect to queries to downweight hubs by normalizing the similarity vector to have unit length. The second approach, named the globally corrected, or GC approach, reverses the query direction, returning the gallery sample that ranks the given query highest amongst all queries, rather than the gallery sample ranked highest by the query. Since this produces many tied ranks, tie breaking is performed with cosine similarities. The GC method was found to work better by Dinu et al. in their tasks, so we'll focus on the GC method here. We can interpret this approach in the QB norm framework by building the query bank from test queries and optionally adding further samples from the training set. We then compute QB norm similarities as follows where the rank function, shown in red, returns the rank of the first argument, which here is the raw similarity from query Q to gallery sample J, as shown in blue, with respect to the array of elements in the second argument, which is the probe vector for gallery sample J, shown in green. The trailing term here subtracts the raw similarity from the result to break ties. We next consider the inverted softmax, introduced by Smith et al. in the context of aligning word embeddings from distinct languages. In this problem setting, word embeddings are trained independently for two languages and then brought into alignment with a linear transformation, which Smith et al. showed should be orthogonal if it is to act consistently in both directions. Translation of a given word amounts to a nearest neighbor search in embedding space. Consequently, hubness raises its fearsome head. To mitigate this, the authors propose to assess the quality of a translation as the probability that the target word translates back into the source word. This is less susceptible to hubs than the traditional approach of assessing the probability that a source word translates to the target candidate word. The approach is implemented with an inverted softmax, which can be cast into the query bank normalization framework by first building a query bank, which ideally includes all possible queries, but can be restricted for efficiency reasons to a random subsample. QB norm similarities are then computed as follows, where beta is a hyperparameter representing the inverse temperature, and exp with square brackets denotes element-wise exponentiation. 
building further on this body of work, Cono et al. consider the problem of fully unsupervised alignment of word embeddings from distinct languages. They note that the globally corrected and inverted softmax hubness mitigation techniques are asymmetric with respect to source and target languages, which is perhaps not ideal, and that the inverted softmax in particular requires fitting the inverse temperature hyperparameter with cross-validation, which they are unable to do in an unsupervised setting. To tackle these issues, they propose cross-domain similarity local scaling, or CSLS. The intuition behind this method is that we should increase the similarity associated with isolated word vectors and decrease the similarities of vectors in dense areas. This is achieved by modifying the similarity metric such that similarities between vectors are downweighted with the average similarity between each vector and their respective local neighbourhoods. This too can be interpreted within the QB norm framework. We build the query bank from all available queries. The more, the merrier. We use p hat j to denote the probe vector restricted to the k query bank samples closest to the gallery sample gj, and we let s hat q denote the unnormalized similarity vector sq restricted to the k gallery samples closest to the query q. We then obtain QB norm similarities as follows, where this term in blue accounts for average similarity in the local neighbourhood of query sample Q, and this term in green accounts for the average similarity in the local neighbourhood of gallery sample J. As with the inverted softmax, CSLS does have a hyperparameter, the neighbourhood size K. However, in practice, Kono et al. find that performance is relatively insensitive to its value, and thus cross-validation is not essential. When conducting preliminary experiments with the three methods just described, we found that for the inverted softmax, which often works well for cross-modal retrieval, performance can degrade significantly if the query bank and the gallery distributions differ significantly. In particular, there are issues when the nearest neighbours of the query bank samples are concentrated in a very small fraction of the gallery. This characteristic is not ideal for a general purpose solution for retrieval. What we'd like is something that works well in favourable conditions, but also does no harm to performance when building a good query bank is challenging. To this end, we can build something akin to a kind of extended hybrid of the inverted softmax and CSLS by pre-computing something known as the gallery activation set, defined as follows. Here, the argmax lk notation for a function fl denotes the kmax select operator that returns the k values of l that maximize f of l. Note here that both J and L index over the gallery. In blue here, we have similarities between query bank vectors and gallery vectors. Intuitively, this gallery activation set contains the indices of the gallery vectors that the query bank has identified as potential hubs by finding the K nearest neighbors of the query bank samples. We can then define an dynamic inverted softmax by only activating the inverted softmax for nearest neighbour retrievals that fall within the gallery activation set. In practice, this means that we compute QB norm similarities as follows, where we use the typical inverted softmax shown in green here if the closest gallery sample to the query falls within the gallery activation set and fall back to raw similarities, shown in red here, otherwise. The only additional inference cost incurred over the standard inverted softmax is the use of the argmax operation, amounting to a nearest neighbour search. Thankfully, thanks to mature approximate nearest neighbour search libraries 
this can be performed very efficiently at large scale. The benefit of the dynamic inverted softmax, as we will see in the experiments, is its improved robustness. We'll next give a brief sketch of the influence of these normalization strategies on inference cost. To keep things clear, we'll consider the cost of exact similarity searches, though in practice, approximate nearest neighbor searches are employed for large scale deployments. We also focus on describing naive implementations to convey the basic intuition of what is involved, rather than optimized variants. We begin by noting that all strategies incur an initial order n cost corresponding to computing the similarity between a test query and all n samples in the gallery. Since we typically care most about inference cost, we will also assume in the description below that we have pre-computed similarities between each query rank query and each gallery sample, which requires compute and storage costs of order nn. For the globally corrected method, our task is to determine the rank of the test query with respect to each gallery item. For this, given pre-computed similarities between the query rank and the gallery, we can also pre-compute rankings. For each test query, we then establish its rank amongst the query bank for each gallery sample. This can be done with a binary search over the sorted pre-computed similarities for a cost of order n log m. For a simple implementation of cross-domain similarity local scaling, we need to find the k query bank samples closest to each gallery sample and the k gallery samples closest to the query. For one, we can pre-compute for each gallery sample the k closest query bank similarities and store the averages in a vector of size n. For two, we need to compute the average similarity of the k most similar items in the gallery to the test query during inference. By using quick select, we can do this in order n time on average, noting that we do not need the top k element similarities to be sorted since they will be averaged. When using the inverted softmax, we must compute the denominator term consisting of the sum of similarities given the query bank. This can be done with pre-computation for each gallery item and stored in a vector of size n. During inference, the similarities are divided by this pre-computed sum, which adds only constant time overhead. One benefit of pre-computing the sum in this manner is that it also reduces the storage cost associated with the query bank from order mn to order n, since we can discard the memory allocated to store the similarities from each query in the query bank and each sample in the gallery. When considering the dynamic inverted softmax, we incur the same costs as the inverted softmax, plus a little extra overhead. The additional gallery activated set employed by the dynamic inverted softmax can be pre-computed and stored for an additional order n cost. There is also an additional cost during inference. The top one search to determine the sample originally retrieved by the test query, which determines whether or not the inverted softmax is to be applied. When using exact similarities, this costs linear time, i.e. order n. Next, we come to experiments. We'll first describe the datasets used in this work to assess the value of QB norm for cross-modal retrieval. For text video retrieval, experiments are conducted on MSR VTT, MSVD, Didymo, LSMDC, Vatex, ActivityNet, and QueryD. For text image retrieval, MS Coco is used. For text audio retrieval, we use audio caps. And finally, we also explore retrieval within the same modality for the case of image to image retrieval on CUB 200 2011 and Stanford Online Products. To evaluate performance, we use the two metrics defined earlier, recall at K, where higher is better, and median rank, where lower is better. 
The first set of experiments were conducted to understand whether hubness affects modern cross-modal retrieval methods. For this, we examined the retrieval distribution for recall at one. Here, the data being studied is the MSR VTT dataset 1KA split, and the retrieval method is collaborative experts. On the x-axis, we plot video IDs, of which there are 1,000 in total for this dataset, which have been ordered according to their retrieval frequency. And on the y-axis, we plot the number of times each video was retrieved as the top ranked result by the test 1000 queries. We see first that approximately half of the 1000 videos in the gallery are simply never retrieved by the method as the top ranked result for any query. At the other end of the spectrum, we have a few videos retrieved eight times as the top ranked result in a manner characteristic of hubs. Two extra comments are in order here. First, we are plotting retrievals under the criteria of appearing as the top ranked result, rather than in the top K results as was done in the previous works discussed. The latter choice produces more extreme distributions, but is a little less intuitive, so we focused on top one retrievals here. Second, it's important to ask, what would this graph look like without hubness? A method that randomly selected uniformly from the gallery for each query would produce a curve that is not flat, but flatter than this one. Thanks to the binomial distribution, we know that it is highly improbable for a single video to be retrieved eight times by chance. By contrast, a perfect retrieval method for this dataset would produce a flat plot with one retrieval per video. To see whether this retrieval distribution is an artifact of the specific method considered, we repeated the experiment with further retrieval methods, teach text CE+, multimodal transformer, and clip to video, each on the same MSR VTT 1KA dataset split. In each case, we observe a similar trend, with a small number of hub-like videos being retrieved frequently. Next, we can investigate whether this kind of retrieval distribution is simply an artifact of the dataset we were studying, or is more widespread. For this, the TeachText CE plus method is applied to ActivityNet, Didymo, LSMDC, and Vatex. Note that this last dataset is a little different in that it has 10 queries per video rather than one query per video. In each case, we observe a handful of videos displaying a hub-like tendency to be retrieved with high frequency. These experiments suggest that the hubness phenomenon is not confined to a particular retrieval model or dataset. The next experiments investigate the practicality of QB norm. First, we note that the previous work of Liu et al. has shown that the benefits of using the inverted softmax and other related techniques for cross-modal retrieval with natural language queries. However, this approach assumes concurrent access to all test queries, and indeed the motivation described by Liu et al. for doing so is to leverage the bipartite assumption that each query should have one and only one ground truth target in the gallery. In practice, a relaxation of this assumption can also be considered in which the targets of the query set are uniformly distributed over the gallery. This works well for many retrieval benchmarks, which are often curated from existing captioning datasets to minimize annotation costs. Unfortunately, this assumption may not be widely applicable for real-world deployments of retrieval systems, where the interests of users will not necessarily be uniformly spread over the gallery, and where we are unlikely to have all users enter their query at exactly the same time. This raises the question, do we need access to multiple test set queries at the same time in order to mitigate hubness during inference? To answer this question, experiments are conducted that apply the dynamic inverted softmax on MSR VTT with the TeachText CE plus method with different query banks. The baseline which does not use a query bank, 
and corresponds to standard retrieval, achieves a recall at 1 of 14.9. Here, the numbers depicted in subscripts after each metric depict the standard deviation across three randomly seeded runs. If we construct the query bank from all test queries, we find that we get a significant boost in performance, reaching a recall at 1 of 17.5. This is similar in spirit to the approach of Lu et al. and mirrors their findings. However, by using a query bank from the training set of equivalent size to the test set query bank, we find that we attain very similar performance. Here, a recall at 1 of 17.3. For completeness, it is also possible to construct the query bank from the validation set, which also yields a boost over the no query bank baseline, here attaining a recall at 1 of 16.6, .6, but lagging the performance of the training set and test set query banks due to the diminished size caused by fewer available queries. The conclusion of this experiment is that test set query banks are not required to mitigate hubness. This has significant implications for practical deployment of query bank normalization in cross-modal systems, since it suggests that the query bank can be constructed offline without a major penalty in performance. For the remaining experiments, query banks are constructed from the training set. The next experiment explores the influence of query bank size on performance by constructing query banks of different sizes with the same experimental setup as the previous experiment. Here we plot the results with the number of queries in the query bank for the x-axis and the geometric mean of recall at 1, recall at 5 and recall at 10 on the y-axis. We observe that performance improves with query bank size with diminishing returns at larger scales. We also observe that strong results can be obtained by constructing the query bank from just a few thousand training samples. We next studied the influence of the similarity normalization strategy used as part of QB norm. For this, we sample a query bank of 5,000 samples for the training set and compare various normalization strategies, again using the TeachTech CE plus method. We first report the baseline model that makes no use of a query bank and attains 14.9 recall at one. We then evaluate retrieval performance for the globally corrected CSLS, inverted softmax, and dynamic inverted softmax normalization strategies on the MSR VTT dataset. We observe that while globally corrected brings a clear gain over the baseline, the latter three methods are more effective, with inverted softmax and dynamic inverted softmax achieving recall at one scores that fall within a standard deviation across the seeded runs. On other metrics, the ordering between the last three methods changes slightly, but each brings approximately comparable performance, with the inverted softmax marginally outperforming the other two approaches. This query bank can be considered in-domain in the sense that the training set queries and test gallery are drawn from the same underlying dataset. A takeaway of this experiment is that when performing in domain, all query bank normalization methods bring gains with the inverted softmax performing slightly better than the alternatives. Next, we consider sampling a query bank to improve performance from a close domain that is not identical to that of the queries. In particular, we evaluate performance for globally corrected CSLS, inverted softmax, and dynamic inverted softmax with the query bank sampled from MSVD. This time, we see that globally corrected brings a more modest gain over the baseline. The latter three methods each bring a slightly larger gain, with dynamic inverted softmax slightly outperforming CSLS and inverted softmax on recall at one, and with broadly similar performance on other metrics. Again, the takeaway here is that for a close domain query bank, all QB norm normalization methods bring gains. We then consider sampling from a query bank from a domain that is 
relatively far away in terms of video and query distribution. By evaluating performance for globally corrected CSLS, inverted softmax and dynamic inverted softmax. This time, we observe that globally corrected and dynamic inverted softmax preserve the performance of the original baseline, but CSLS and inverted softmax see a major degradation in performance. Thus, for far domain query banks, only globally corrected and dynamic inverted softmax preserve the performance of the baseline. These results bring up the natural question of why it might be that far domain query banks either bring little benefit or are actively harmful to performance for some methods. After investigation, it was found that queries from the query bank only retrieve a small subset of videos from the gallery when the gallery lies in a different domain. This may render the query bank ineffective at probing for hubs. In order to validate that the retrieval distribution was indeed linked to performance. An adversarial query bank was constructed from MSRVTT by selecting the 5,000 training queries that achieved the smallest coverage of the gallery. That is to say, the queries that retrieved the lowest number of distinct videos over the MSRVTT test set. We report numbers for this adversarial query bank with the same four normalization strategies. We observe that apart from the dynamic inverted softmax, all three remaining strategies actively harm the performance of the original baseline, suggesting that the dynamic inverted softmax is most robust to query banks that achieve poor coverage of the gallery. We can summarize these results by computing the geometric mean of each performance metric of each of the four settings reported above. By considering the results in aggregate, we observed that dynamic inverted softmax performs best and that consequently it represents a good all-round choice. For this reason, dynamic inverted softmax is used for the remaining experiments, unless stated otherwise. Since methods such as the inverted softmax and dynamic inverted softmax require a choice of inverse temperature hyperparameter, beta, an experiment is conducted to assess the influence of this value on performance. This experiment uses dynamic inverted softmax with teach text CE plus on MSR VTT for a range of inverse temperatures. The results are shown here, where we have inverse temperature beta on the x-axis and geometric mean of recall at 1, recall at 5 and recall at 10 on the y-axis. Here, a value of 20 for beta worked well, and this value was used for all experiments that employed the teach text CE plus method. However, it is worth noting that in general, a good choice for this hyperparameter depends on the embedding and is best set via validation on a held out set. As an example, for another retrieval method, clip to video, the distances in the embedding space are scaled quite differently to the teach text model used above, and a value of 1 over 1.99 works well. The next experiment studies the role of the k hyperparameter used by the dynamic inverted softmax, which controls the top k selection operator that is used to construct the gallery activation set. For this, an experiment is conducted to apply the dynamic inverted softmax to teach text with CE plus on MSR VTT with a query bank of 5,000 samples. As before, we start from a baseline with no query bank normalization. We then examine performance as we increase the value of the K hyperparameter from one up to 10. We observe that performance is relatively insensitive to this choice, with numbers getting slightly better as k increases, but not by much. We then repeat the experiment for a query bank sourced from a far domain, again varying the k hyperparameter from 1 up to 10. This time we observe a slight worsening of performance. Given these results, k is fixed to 1 for all experiments to provide a reasonable compromise between in-domain and far-domain performance.
The original motivation for QB norm was that existing cross-modal retrieval methods suffer from hubness. But does QB norm actually mitigate hubness? To answer this, we return to the k occurrence distribution, nk, that we saw earlier, where nk of x is defined as a sum over indicator variables that are in turn defined to take the value of 1 if x is among the k nearest neighbours of query qi and 0 otherwise. That is to say, nk captures how many times a point appears in the k nearest neighbour lists of queries. We measure hubness via the skewness of the k occurrence distribution, defined as follows, where mu nk denotes the mean of nk and sigma nk denotes the standard deviation of nk. We use the definition above by taking x to represent gallery video embeddings and qi as to represent the embedding of a query text. The value of k is set to 10 following Feldbauer et al. With the definition in hand, we compute the hubness of the teach text CE plus baseline on MSR VTT, both before and after applying QB norm, which we see achieves a significant reduction in skewness. On Didymo, we see a skewness of 1.21 reduced to 0.39. On LSMDC, skewness is reduced from 0.715 to 0.321. And finally, on MS Coco, skewness is reduced from 0.56 to 0.16. The takeaway is that QB norm appears to produce a significant reduction in hubness as measured via the skewness in the k occurrence distribution. We can also look at the influence of QB norm on the retrieval distribution for recall at 1. Here we have video IDs ranked by their retrieval frequency on the x-axis and the number of retrievals on the y-axis. In this case, the dataset is MSR VTT 1K A split and the retrieval method is teach text CE+. The pink dashed horizontal line shows the retrieval distribution of an ideal method, while the yellow line shows the baseline without QB norm. We see that the purple line, which indicates the retrieval distribution using QB norm, shifts closer to the ideal case. We find a similar effect when considering video retrieval on either ActivityNet or Vatex, as well as when performing image retrieval on MS Coco with the MMT Oscar retrieval method. We next look at experiments that evaluate the use of QB norm for text video retrieval, starting with the MSR VTT dataset under the commonly used 1KA split. For this, various models are reported together with their retrieval metrics. Here are a few baselines to provide context. As before, subscripts such as this one denote the standard deviation of performance across three randomly seeded runs, where such information is available either from previous papers or where pre-trained models associated with multiple seeds can be obtained. Building on top of two additional baselines, teach text CE plus and clip to video, and applying QB norm yields boosts of 3.7 and 1.6 recall at 1 respectively, as well as gains over other recall metrics. On the slightly less popular MSR VTT full splits, QB norm is applied on top of CE+, teach text CE+, and clip for clip, in each case bringing a healthy boost. On Vatex, Further gains are observed across different models, although performance has saturated at the minimum for medium rank metric, so we do not observe gains there. On query D, we see a similar directional trend, but the gains are less consistent and much weaker, highlighted in lime green, where the margin between results is not sufficiently large to ensure that the standard deviations across runs do not overlap. Further experiments for text video retrieval are conducted on MSVD, bringing mild gains, on LSMDC, 
again, broadly boosting performance on activity net, where the gains are a little larger, and on Didymo, where again, QB norm brings a benefit under most metrics over multiple methods. The effect of QB norm is also examined for other retrieval tasks. On MS Coco 5K, which is used to evaluate text image retrieval, QB norm boosts the performance of two baselines. Similarly, on Cub 200 2011, which evaluates image to image retrieval, QB norm brings a boost for the RDML method, while on Stanford Online Products, which also evaluates image to image retrieval, a similar trend can be seen, although the effect here is somewhat weak. On Audio Caps, which is used to evaluate text audio retrieval, QB norm brings a fairly solid gain. A next set of experiments investigates whether embedding dimensionality plays a significant role in QB norm's effectiveness, motivated by the suggestion of Radovanovich et al. that hubness is intrinsic to high dimensional space. Beyond the direct dimensionality of the data, Radovanovich suggests that what may be more important is what they refer to as the intrinsic dimensionality of the data, which is, roughly speaking, the minimum number of features required to account for all pairwise distances between data points. To study the role of dimensionality, an experiment is conducted that evaluates TeachText CE Plus on MSR VTT with and without dynamic inverted softmax for different dimensions. The results are shown here with shared embedding dimensionality on the x-axis and geometric mean of recall at 1, recall at 5, and recall at 10 on the y-axis. We observe that there is no noticeable difference in the gain yielded by QB norm for different embedding dimensions. From the perspective of Radovanovich et al., this may be an indication that simply altering the embedding dimensionality of the model does not affect its intrinsic dimensionality. To dig a little deeper, an additional experiment considers the effect of adding video modalities as a potential mechanism to increase the intrinsic dimensionality of the shared embedding. The intuition here is that additional modalities, such as using audio in addition to vision, may provide complementary cues and may therefore require more embedding capacity. To investigate this idea, teach text with CE plus is trained on MSR VTT with different numbers of modalities. The results are shown here with number of modalities on the x-axis and geometric mean of R1, R5 and R10 on the y-axis. We observe that the margin between the two lines, i.e. the model with and without QB norm, stays relatively constant but increases very slightly as the number of modalities increase. This provides weak evidence that QB norm is more effective for embeddings with higher intrinsic dimensionality, but is somewhat inconclusive and certainly does not suggest a strong effect. Finally, we come to the discussion. In terms of limitations, all the normalization techniques considered in combination with QB norm incur additional pre-computation costs beyond those associated with simple similarity search. In addition, the proposed dynamic inverted softmax adds a small additional cost over other approaches since it must check whether the top ranked result falls within the gallery activation set. In practice, however, this can be done very efficiently. Perhaps a greater limitation relates to adversarial query back. We have seen that when the query bank is out of domain or is selected adversarially, there is little benefit to QB norm. Third, to make use of QB norm with either the dynamic inverted softmax or the inverted softmax, we must select a temperature hyperparameter. We saw in the ablations that this can have a significant effect on performance. A useful direction for future work could be to determine this automatically without access to validation data from the target domain. Turning to societal impact, 
cross-modal retrieval is a powerful and widely applicable technology. And as such, improvements in performance have implications across several domains. It can enable efficient content discovery for researchers, musicians, artists, and consumers, for example. It also has security applications for identifying threats in multimodal content. By the same token, however, it may also lend itself as a tool of political oppression, for example, by efficiently searching social media and blog content to automatically discover signs of political dissent. Let's conclude with a brief summary. We have discussed QBNorm, a framework for mitigating hubness in cross-modal retrieval. As part of this framework, we've also seen that the dynamic inverted softmax provides a robust similarity normalization strategy. Through experiments, we have seen that QB norm has fairly wide applicability across a range of tasks, models, and benchmarks. And in particular, we've seen promising results on text video retrieval, text image retrieval, image to image retrieval, and text audio retrieval. Importantly, we've seen that QB norm is effective without concurrent access to multiple text queries, making it practical for deployment. That's it. We've reached the end. Thank you for listening.